Your holy God and your great Lord God, and I bless your name. I bless your name, Lord. For there is no one like you. There is no one greater than you. There is no one more honorable. There is nothing bigger than you. You are majestic, Lord God. You are everything that we'll ever need, Lord God. You are the great healer, Lord God. You set us free, Lord God. You are the financial provider, Lord God. You are everything, Lord God. You are our protector, Lord God. You are our shelter, Lord God. You are everything, God. And I bless you with all that is in me today, Lord God. With all that is in me today, I say thank you, Jesus. I thank you for the people who can't praise you, Lord God. I thank you for the people who can't praise you, Lord God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. your Bibles. I told you for those of you who were here when Pastor said it, I came with the premeditated praise. With the premeditated praise. If you got your Bibles, turn with us to John the 14th chapter. Bibles, turn with us to John the 14th chapter. Show you something real quickly. Show you something. I'm sorry. I forgive me. Forgive me. How many of y'all know that's what the word says? I'm sorry, but you're still struggling as to whether or not you believe it. Okay, I thought I'd get that out the way first. How many of y'all know that God cannot lie? So I like, I like how Bishop Daly used to say it. He said, you know, if, if God is a man that cannot lie, then the key is to get him to say something, right? Now, I'm going to show you what he said. And then I'm going I'm to I'm judge whether or not you believe what I just said based upon how you act when I show you what he said. Everybody got that? So watch this now. He cannot lie, right? Aaron, that's enough for me to start praising him right there. But watch this, watch this. John 14, Jesus said this. He said in verse 13, he said, And whatsoever ye shall ask, Lord, I, I'm trying to move Nicole. Lord, this is good, mother. Aaron, he didn't say I had to see it first. Jason, he didn't say I had to see it first, but he said, whatever you ask, Jeff, in my name. I don't know about y'all, but I know for a lot of people, it's Christmas time, and they, and they got their list, and they're getting ready to shop and find out who's been naughty or nice. But I'm going to tell you something. Just based upon this text right here, if I had any type of spiritual sense at all, I would start getting my list together. Because the beautiful thing about Jesus is he didn't ask you whether or not you had been naughty or nice. He just said, whatever you ask. I don't know about y'all, but I would start getting in my spirit what I need the Lord to do, what I need the Lord to work. Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. Lord, have mercy. You remember when we were in Cleveland and I started preaching, I told you that there's stuff that God want to do for his name's sake. It ain't got nothing to do with you as much as it is. It's his name's sake. Matter of fact, what that means is he wants bragging rights. Lord, have mercy. You know, my feet, my feet starting to get light. Jesus. He said, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now get this. Though Jesus has come and gone, we have him living on the inside of us. So that means when we pray, whatever we pray about, God delights in doing it, that God will be glorified, watch this, in us. Verse 14 says, If ye ask, shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Some of y'all still stuck. I'm not even going to verse 15. 
He said, basically, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. How many of y'all want to act like it's already done? I, Aaron, I thought they wanted to have church today. I really did. If it's already done, why you acting like you're not sure how things going to turn out? Why you acting like you're not sure that it's already done? Well, listen, listen. Based upon your praise, I want you to act like your job is to convince the person standing next to you that it's already done. Based upon your praise. Already done, already done, already done. Praise the Lord. This time, amen. Deacon 
Reuben Smith is going to prepare to bring forth the message this morning. Let's receive by saying amen. amen. teach your word, I said you would open up my mouth, give to me the words to say to your people, in the mighty name of Jesus we pray, amen, amen, God bless you and you may be seated in the presence of the Lord, amen, it is indeed good to be here today, amen, it's good to see y'all, amen, so I must get this out of the way, before we go too far, I'm excited, Today, because it's not a secret to many of you that one of my desires is to become a member of this congregation. And, uh, and since I'm ministering the word today, I've decided to give myself the right hand to fellowship. Amen. So I hereby declare myself a member of New Bethel House of Prayer. Is that all right? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Is it possible? Can I have a dual membership? Apostle say he don't like that. He said, I don't want nobody with no dual membership. If you die, I'm not going to bury you <laughs> with no dual membership. Man, so, you know, I hope I might be able to break those rules and have a dual membership. Amen. But it's indeed glad to be here today. God truly has been good to us. Amen. I, I, I like to honor, amen, my father, amen, my pastor, my bishop, my apostle, apostle Lawrence Samuel Smith. Amen. He is truly a man of great faith. And I looked at him the other week with wonder and amazement, and I didn't tell him I started to. And I looked at him, and I, I started to tell him, I have never seen anyone like me. I've never seen anyone like this man. It, it's one thing to uh, talk a good game, you know, say, well, you know, when I get sick, you know, I'm going to come to church and I'm going to still give God glory. But it's one thing to actually put that in action. And when I saw him still marching around the church the other week, I said, there's one of two things. This man is truly a man of God or he is stone crazy. I do believe it's a little of both. Amen. Amen. But we appreciate him today. Likewise, my uh, second oldest brother. Amen. I like to honor him today. Amen. Vicar Bishop, ain't that right? He told me just elder, but that, you know. Amen. Uh, but we are glad to be here today. Glad you had me. And uh, as well, this young man, yes, I do. I, I patterned my life after him. I do. I told him last time we were here, I said, you know you and your wife living my life. Y'all know that, right? Y'all living my life. Amen. But I am so, yes, right. Uh, but I am uh, indeed glad to be here. Amen. Glad to see my mother, my wife. Amen. Abundant harvest. Amen. It is good to be here. Um, 
you know, oftentimes people will say that it was a press or a struggle to get to a certain place. And, you know, a lot of times us as black folk, and we tend, you know, to exaggerate. It wasn't that much of a press, but it sounds good. It, you know, it makes it sound a little bit. It was a press for me to make it here, but it was a press today. Amen. And I thank God because this isn't something I'm just saying, but the adversary really didn't want me to make it here today. And I almost didn't make it. Earlier this week, somebody tried to get me arrested. Amen. The adversary has been on my track. But nevertheless, I'm here to stand before the saints of God and give God glory. I also made a promise before God. God, that I will serve you until the day that I die. No matter what come in my life. No matter what the adversary decides to try to do to me. God, I'll serve you. God, I'll worship you. God, I'll magnify you. God, I'll lift you up. So we're here today, amen, to give God glory. We have to get into the Bible. I told my brother, I said, I'm going to try my best to keep this to about 15 minutes. He said, you can't. You talk too much. I've been about, about 15 minutes already. Ain't that right? Do the very best that we can today. We ask that you get your Bibles. Turn with us to 2 Samuel, the 6th chapter. And I was excited when I, I walked in the door and then I, 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 I figured out why the adversary didn't want me to be here because when I walked in the door, this young man right here, Brother Joe, right? He's giving the Taz testimony, am I right? He was all in my message. You said two words. That's right in my message and we're going to get to that in a couple of minutes. And I said, God, that's why. Amen. So get your Bibles. Go with us to 2 Samuel sixth chapter and in our haste to be here I was unable to uh, get my my large print Bible that's what Elder Smith said you know stop being cheap get an iPad and just blow, blow it right on up but nevertheless we ask that you would bear with us second Samuel the sixth chapter and we will begin at verse 13 it says and it was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw the king leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. And they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings, sacrifices, and peace offerings before the Lord. And as soon as David had made an end of offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Amen. We ask that you get your Bibles. Turn with us to Mark, the sixth chapter. And Mark, chapter six. at verse 38 it says he saith unto them how many loaves have ye go and see and when they knew they say five and two fishes and he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass, and they sat down in the ranks by hundreds and by fifties. 
And when they had taken the five loaves and two, fi and two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And they did all eat and were filled. And they looked up and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fishes. And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. Amen. I, I, I encourage you to look at your neighbor and tell them, amen. I've got a ridiculous praise for a senseless blessing. Amen. I've got a ridiculous praise a senseless blessing. Amen. In Mark, the sixth chapter, it begins out by uh, giving an account of how the Messiah had returned into his own country. And they looked at him and they marveled and they say words like, you know, is this not the carpenter's son? Who is he? Or from whence has he come? Or from whence has he all this wisdom? All of these words to say. The Bible goes on to say how he couldn't do many miracles there because of their unbelief. And he went on to say that a prophet, in, in essence, is without honor what in his own country, right? So, you know, and I, I understood that. I began to understand that when I began to start ministering my own self because uh, I don't know about here at New Bethel. See, y'all going to enjoy this word, but, you know, the folks at Abundant Harvest get this good gospel dripping from my lips on a consistent basis and they don't appreciate it ain't that right abundant harvest y'all don't appreciate it get no honor in my own house amen i said jesus you know exactly what you're talking about amen but mark the sixth chapter goes on to as well give an account concerning uh, what had happened to john the baptist and gave an account concerning that and how uh, there was a time that uh, Herodias had, uh, uh, had her daughter dance before Herod. And Herodias wanted uh, John the Baptist's head because he told Herod it was not good for him to have his brother's wife. And she did not like that saying and she did not receive it kindly. So she looked for an occasion where she could put John to death, but Herod didn't want to do it because he feared so he did not want to do it so there came an occasion on the king's birthday amen that uh they had this young lady to dance before him it's a good time to take a water break amen to dance before him and um you know this might be a good time uh first lady to uh shut the cameras down i don't know if you want this going before i get started i have to give my disclaimer amen the views and opinions of deacon reuben israel smith are not necessarily those of apostle lawrence samuel smith abundant harvest house of prayer or any of his associate members as well as the house of god at large all right so i got that out the way now the Bible goes on to say that this young lady danced and he said, woman, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. And I began to think to myself, I wonder what kind of dance she was doing. And I thought to myself, uh, Deacon Emery, she wasn't doing a Macarena. You know, she, she wasn't doing a Macarena. She wasn't doing an electric slide. Amen. But, 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 but my memory, uh, my mind began to wonder. I said, Lord have mercy. I bet she was dropping it like it was hot. Amen. I said, you know, she was, she was dropping it like it was hot. Yes, you know, she would, Pastor, close your eyes. She was backing that thing up. You know, that must have been the kind of dance that she was doing for this king to say, look, whatever you desire, I will give you. I said, Minister, I'm not exactly 100% sure what she was doing, but I promise you, I'm going to try to get Sister Felicia to do it later on tonight. Amen. Listen, I didn't get married to play patty cake. Amen. 
I told you you might want to shut them cameras off. You know, now I know we talk, while we on the subject, we talking about dancing, you know, and I know all y'all, y'all, and y'all pretend like y'all save and don't listen to no more R&B. Amen, but Beyonce got a song out. Tonight I'm going to dance for you, Deacon Emery. I told my wife, you need to hear this. Felicia, didn't I put it on for you? I put it on for you. I said, baby, you need to hear this. Yes, sir. I told her. I said, honey, you need to hear this. But nonetheless, so she did this dance, and, you know, her mother told her to ask for the head of John the Baptist. So that's what happened, and John the Baptist had lost his head. And it goes on in Mark, the sixth chapter, to give an account how Jesus began to charge his disciples. He began to give them charge of what to do, where to go, what to do when you get there, so forth and so on. And we find ourselves in Mark, the sixth chapter, uh, in about the 38th verse, and it begins to give an account of how uh, Jesus was in a desert place, a place where it was dry. It was lacking, no resources, but he was teaching the people and he decided that he wanted to, them to have something to eat. But the disciples said, Lord, send them away. This is a desert place. So uh, Jesus said, no, we're not going to send them away. He says, well, what do you have? They said, we don't have anything but what, five loaves and two fishes. He said, that's all we have. He said, bring it to me. Now, I don't know about you, but when I do my adding together, five plus two is seven. Not with God. Five plus two equal 5,000. And I said, God, that's a senseless blessing. That's something that don't make no sense. That's something that just don't add up. I don't know about anybody else, but has anybody ever been there where God has done something for you that just didn't make no sense? When God has delivered you, when it wasn't the convenient thing to do, when God took you from the pit and moved you on up to the palace, I'm talking to those people tonight. A senseless blessing. I began to look at my own life and how when I was about 20 years old, I was in the field of telecommunications and computers. And we was doing all right. Hey man, I was doing all right. I said, who wouldn't serve a guy like this? This is the type of life I was living. About 22 years old, making close to $50,000 a year. And that was about 10 years ago. And I bought my house. I was married. I was, you know, I was doing all right. And I got laid off. And, you know, and the type of faith that we was always taught to have was, you know, you believe that God will work a miracle. And, you know, he's going to do it. He's going to bring you out. So Deacon Emery, you know, I was fool enough to believe that, all right, I was laid off. I'm going to come home tomorrow. And it's going to be another job on my answering machine. And how many know that that, well, that did not happen? You know, I often use the analogy that God will often take you up to the brink of the cliff and push you over. Y'all thought I was going to say he going to pull you back. No, he going to push you over. He going to see how you are going to respond. So he pushed me over. And he took us from a, a, a area in our lives where we were very happy and very prosperous and all that good stuff to an unfamiliar area. I had no idea what it was to struggle. I never grew up like that. I didn't know what it was not to be able to pay bills, not to be able to know what you're going to Well, I'll be honest, we always had some beans or something, but who want to eat beans? Let's be real with it. God, I want some steak. I want some chicken. I want to do like I do now. Baby, go to the market. Don't matter what you spend. Amen. So God took us from a situation where I was in telecommunications. I went to school for that. We was doing well with that. 
So he moved me from there to the transportation industry, which I knew nothing. When I say nothing, all I know is a car got four wheels and an engine. That's about it. So he took me to the transportation industry. Knew nothing about it. And he gave me favor right there. Now I said, God, this is something that just don't make sense. It don't add up. I went to school for telecom, but you took me out of telecom, moved me to the transportation industry. When I got laid off, I was making about 50000 a year. How many know that he doubled the household income? And that's one of the reasons why I got a ridiculous praise for a senseless blessing. Back in 2 Samuel, the sixth chapter, we find that the King David, they were moving the Ark of the Covenant. And what had happened was, is that the Ark itself had begun to stumble and sway. And there was a man by the name of Uzzah. And I always feel bad for my man Uzzah because the ark was unstable and he stretched his hand out. And Uzzah was just trying to do a good deed. But the, but the ark of the covenant, oh God got displeased with Uzzah because you weren't supposed to touch the ark of the covenant with your hand. So he went to do that and God was displeased and smote him right there. I said, Lord have mercy for Uzzah. Thought he was doing something good, lost his life. Amen. So David saw this thing and he was afraid and he was displeased. So the king says, you know what? I will bring the ark no further. I don't know about anybody. Else. When I preach, I need a lot of water. I'm sorry. I might need another one, one of these. Oh my God, what is this poor five-year-old? I need a little more. I just need, need a little bit more than that. Maybe wet, wet my beak a little bit. Amen. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. All right. Listen, my father made me preach. I wasn't going to do it. My father, my father made me preach. Uh, but nonetheless, so Uzzah got smote on the spot. The king saw this and he was afraid. This, but he said, the ark will go no further. He says, well, a, a, a letter turned aside into the house of Obed-Edom, right? So, so and that, that puzzled me. I said, my God, David, you the king and you throw Obed-Edom under the bus. He said, he said, Obed-Edom, he said, if something bad going to happen, it's going to happen under your roof, not under mine. So, but what ended up happening was, word got back to the king how God was blessing and prospering the house of Obed-Edom. And I begin to get excited. You know why? Because God was not blessing Obed-Edom because of Obed-Edom. He was reverencing the presence of his own self. He was reverencing the presence of the Almighty God. So King David sins for the ark. He sends for it. And, and, and he was excited and rejoicing to see it. And, 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 and we talk about a ridiculous praise. And, and, and that's what the king had at this time. He had a ridiculous praise because he began to think back of how God plucked him out of obscurity. How God took him from being Jesse's youngest son. How God had passed over Eliab. And how God had passed over his other brothers. And God had showed him favor. How God had took him from smelling horse manure. And God had took him from shoveling dung. How God had took him from the pit and brought him to the palace. So he began to recollect. And he said, God, I owe you a praise. God, I owe you something. Not no ordinary praise. Not no ordinary worship. Not no every Sabbath dance. But God, I owe you something ridiculous. God, I owe you something insane. God, I owe you something out of my mind. God, I owe you a blessing. God, I owe you a blessing. God, I owe you a thank you. God, I owe you a God, I magnify you. So the Bible says that David danced before the Lord in so much that his wife, Michael, Lord have mercy. I looked at that. I said, no wonder the woman got a problem. She got a boy's name. Her name is, my name is Michael. No wonder the woman got problems. 
But she said to the king, she made mockery. How glorious was the king today, uncovering himself amongst all his handmaidens. And he said to her, uh, I'm paraphrasing, he said, woman, he says, if you think this was an issue, uh, the fact that I gave God glory this time, he says, the next time I'll be more vile. The next time I will be more disgusting. The next time I'll be more ridiculous. The next time I'll be more insane. The next time I'll be more out of my mind. You don't understand. I got a ridiculous praise. I got a ridiculous praise. Why? Because he gave me a senseless blessing. getting ready to get out of here we almost done amen we uh listened to our minister roberts last week my god that woman preached she preached so much that i told her after she was done i said lord have mercy minister roberts you preach almost good as i do i said boy you you close you know but 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 she went to joel the second chapter and I got excited because sometimes we always think about God blessing in the natural. But I don't know about anybody else, but God blessed me in the spiritual ridiculously. Something that didn't make no sense. It don't make no sense for a savior to sit on his throne and decide that he's going to come down from glory and wrap himself up in flesh into the womb of a woman and be delivered like you and I to take on the sins of the people. For the Bible says, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Come on, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. Come on somebody, a ridiculous praise for a senseless blessing. Don't make no sense how we did that. Don't make no sense. The Trinity don't make sense. The Godhead don't make sense. But he decided to do that for you and I. So in Joel, the second chapter, and right about the 12th verse, it says, therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garment and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is what? Gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repented him of the evil. Now, verse 14 is what really blessed me. It says, who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him. So, who knoweth? He may turn and leave a blessing behind him. Even though I was yet in my sins. Even though I deserve hell and damnation. The Bible says that he will turn my curse into a blessing. The Bible says, cursed is he who hangeth on a tree. So he took our curse and took it upon him own self. So he said, who knoweth? He might be upset right now, but who knoweth? He might turn and leave a blessing behind him. I don't deserve it I don't deserve it I don't deserve it but he knows 
he knows he knows the hearts of man people don't understand take a uh, station break real quick and uh you know it was funny thinking embry i told you about my people in my own congregation word got back to me that you know you know one of the saints was just, they was wondering you know why god was blessing me so much and you know they said because deacon rupert don't fast and shut in that much so, And they said it, you know. And because I just feel like this today, it was Sister Vanita, she said it. I remember Sister Vanita, we'll talk about it later. Minister Simeon remember it too. It was Sister Vanita. So, you know, it's a little puzzled by it, and I understand because you know we was brought up like that. Well, you ain't fast, you ain't doing that, you ain't doing that. But 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 one thing the saints of God begin to forget is God is not blessing me because of me. God is not blessing me because I'm good. He's blessing me because He is good. Don't have nothing to do with me. Don't have nothing to do with me. But he's blessing me because of his own self. He's blessing me like he blessed Obed Edom. Don't have nothing to do with him, but it got to do with the favor of God upon my life. Now, sometimes preachers come and they say, Well, I don't have a dancing message. But tonight, this is a dancing message. I came. To provoke you to praise. I came to cajole you to give God glory. And in case you're wondering what a ridiculous praise look like, in case you're wondering, I need me three people, but specific three people. I need me Deacon Allen. I need me Sister Sarah. I need me digging back. Now I know, now I know that New Bethel believes in praising God. I know that. But these are three particular people that I know don't care how they look when they give God glory. They don't care if their face get twisted up. They don't care if they end up rolling on the floor. So, Sister Sarah, you number one. You ready? One, two, three, go. Show them something ridiculous. Show them something senseless. Something that don't make no sense. You ready, Mac? Mac, you ready? You ready, Mac? You ready? Come on, sir. Now that's ridiculous. Boy, you up next. You up next. That's it, that's it, that's it. Now I ain't gonna leave y'all out. If it's anybody else that wanna join in and give God, give God a ridiculous praise. Think about that senseless blessing. Give God glory. Lift him up. Magnify him. Thank you, God. God, I thank you.
One more time. To God, help us out. Be the glory to God. Be the glory to God. Be the glory for the thing. Come on, come on, we exercise at this church. Woo, I got a ridiculous praise. You know, you haven't really given a praise unless you make the person next to you mad. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Here we go. For the thing. For the thing. For the thing. For the thing, for the thing, woo! For the thing, for the thing. Come on, help us praise the Lord. Come on, come on. Go hard or go home. Come on, come on. Praise the Lord. While service is still high, is there anyone who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior? Praise the Lord. This part of the service is for you because you want to get to know him as your personal Savior. Praise the Lord. Anybody that doesn't know Jesus, thank you, Lord. Anybody that knows the Lord Jesus Christ but you've messed up, Somehow your thinking got messed up. As Deacon Smith shared, you thought that it was a works-based type of religion. But you've since concluded that it's not about works as much as it is about relationship. And I tell you, if you keep living, you'll get to the place where you will bless God because of what he did and not for what you do for him. Because I love what Deke shared. God didn't bless him because he was so good. He blessed him because God is good. You know, when you have a blessing plan like that, I got news for you. Haters come along. But you'll, you'll, you'll conclude very easily that it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. That's why the Bible says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he'll make even his enemies to be at peace with him. So if you knew the Lord, but your thinking got messed up, we call it sinking thinking, and you just want prayer. Yes, your spirit was high today, but you just want prayer. This calls for you. The first call is for those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. But the second call is for those who, yeah, I know the Lord, but Pastor, I just need strength. I enjoyed the service today, but you're smart enough to know that, guess what? After service, I'm going to still be struggling in my mind. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Praise him. Come on, let's thank God for one that's coming. There, there are more. There are more. There are more. There are more. I got news for you. After a word like that, nobody has to 
must talk up, you know, a whole lot behind the word of God. All we want you to do is just respond to the word of God. God is real. God loves his people. Amen. Today's service is about knowing that God told you the truth because just watch this. There's nothing you can do to warrant the blessings of God. We talked about this in, in Cleveland, Ohio. What did you do to become a sinner? Nothing. You were born. Because one man messed up, you got born, and now you messed up. But let me tell you something, there's hope for you. The same way that by one man messing up, you became a sinner, same way by another man coming correct, you become righteous. So when you receive Jesus Christ, it's not about what you have to do. It's about what he already did. 